Tonight, we delve into insecurity, the PIB, river state politics, and what the future holds for the APC in the state. Dakuku Kitasai joins us to discuss this and more on Plus Politics. And then, of course, the House of Representatives bill threatens five years jail term for unlawful protesters. This is Post Politics, and I am very anarchal. The year 2021 has been awash with events of kidnapping, abductions, and insecurity. Uh, even to the banning of Twitter, the fight for the electoral bill, and the finding out of a new addition to the bill. Well, the passage of the petroleum industry bill is not left out, and the controversy about the revenue percentage accrued to the host communities. Uh, the former Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, Namasa Dakuku Pichasai, joins us right now to discuss the state of the nation as well as some other issues in the Niger Delta. It's good to have you join us. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Well, I apologize to everyone for starting behind time, but of course the conversation is about to start. Now, uh, just like I said, the, one of the most controversial issues right now is the PIB, the argument from 2% to 5% to the 30% that is also going to be used for, um, you know, um, Frontier. frontiers. Yes, but let's, let's start with the issue of the PIB. Uh, the host communities have said that they initially proposed 10%. But they were hoping for five percent. All they could get was two point five percent. But where, what are your thoughts? Because the different people. I remember Chief J P Clark yesterday said that this is satanic, and he called it very unfair to the people who are in the host communities. But what are your thoughts on the position of the National Assembly? All right. Thank you very much. Let me start by correcting an impression that the host communities asked for ten percent and that they're willing to settle for 5%. That is not the truth. That does not represent the true situation. Um, I'm privileged to come from one of the host communities, one of the host oil producing communities. Now, the, recall that the PIB first, was first presented on the floor of the house um, some 12 years ago. That's one. At the time it was presented, the government, because it was an executive bill then, proposed 10% for the host community development fund. So it was government that proposed. The host communities have insisted all along that what they want is to control their resources and pay tax to the center. And that's the model in other parts of the world, in the United States and in other places where you extract mineral resources. And that is a sustainable model, actually. What it does is that it encourages people to work very hard and contribute to the center. It has worked everywhere that they've applied that model. But again, back to the PIB as it is now, it's not just talking about the ideal. Let's be a bit more realistic and dynamic in our proposal and in the solutions we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. The current situation is that the Senate has proposed 3% to the host community development fund, whereas the house version has proposed 5% to the host community fund. And if you listen very well to Chief E.K. Clark and other leaders of the Niger Delta who are mostly, or who are very often, they are the host communities of oil and gas activities. Yes. Now, they said neither the 3% nor 5% is acceptable to them. So it's not like they would have preferred 5%. Is that needs well, to I be clear. To, I, I spoke to a representative of Pandev yesterday, and he said that 5% would have been better if I they don't were know. offered that. I'm, I'm pretty sure he wasn't speaking for Pandev. Well, he was. He, he is, was speaking he for himself. He was spokesperson. No, he was for, definitely for speaking Pandev. for himself. Now, Chief Clark and other leaders of that region has made it very clear that the minimum they will accept is 10%. Because that's a part of fairness and justice. What it simply says is that, listen, I contribute my shirt and you are giving me one button out of the shirt. So for other people to use this shirt and dress up and have only a button to myself, if you take a heli helicopter flight through that area and see the level of degradation, the uh, level of environmental challenge they face, now coupled with the fact of climate change, you know that the people are literally in danger. They're almost going extinct. I want to say 
that even 5% intervention would not help their matter much. So what, what do you propose the Senate uh, or, or the House would have done? Because this, the House is saying, um, as at today, when people were attacking the National Assembly, the House said that they are sticking to the original plan and the original proposal. They, do not, they cannot speak for the Senate. So what would you have preferred that be done because you are from the host community? I'm not only from the host community. I used to be a member of the National Assembly. So I think I kind of understand how the mind of members of the National Assembly work. It's a national institution where they try to accommodate the interests of all segments of the country. But in At the expense of who? Because mm -hmm. you just mentioned that if you take a, a helicopter ride above these communities, the level of degradation, uh, the, the kinds of things that they're faced with is pretty bad. So if, you, if you are taking into consideration the state of everybody, the, you know, everybody's interest at the expense of the other people. I mean, shouldn't they be the ones who benefit more because they're the ones Simple. who are experiencing most of the hazards that come from exploration in those communities? You're very correct. And so that's the position of the people of the host communities. But there is even a greater challenge. Now, if you want sustainability in the oil and gas industry, if you want peace, if you want cooperation of the communities, then you just have to be fair to them. They're not asking for so much. Now, when we talk about 3%, 5%, 10%, 3 or 5 or 10% of what? Operating expenses or operating expenditure. That's what they're asking for. It will not affect what the contribution to the collective post at the center. Hmm. So I don't think they're being fair to the communities that inhabit the area where you drill oil from. They suffer pollution. Their lives are endangered. In River State, you, of course, you know they're dealing with soot on a daily basis. Oh, yes. Now, they've got lung problems. Lungs problems affect kidneys, cancer. They face all those challenges for the collective good of all at their own detriment. To their own detriment. So, so all they're asking for is, please, can you be fair to us? I think that both the House and Senate should be fair to the host communities because that's a part of peace. That's the part of sustainability of drilling oil. Now, oil is a vanishing product or commodity. Of course. A time will come when oil may be there, but it may not be needed by the rest of the world. In some cities, you have more electric cars than fossil fuel-powered cars. So, in the near future, the oil may be there, you have destroyed the environment, you've destroyed their source of livelihood, and you've given them nothing in return. But I want to put you on the hot seat because you were the boss of Nimasa, you are in the ruling party. I remember, I lived in River State for six years. I was one of the people who were in the forefront of talking about the issue of the suits in River State. We, we tried to get the attention of the states, the states kicked it to the federal, the federal, play, I mean, it was a ping pong game. And today you're here speaking about the suit. What, what role did you play in all of this? Because we're here now talking about spilled milk. It's, it's almost done. So, I mean, what role did you play? Well, I'd like to define two things. The first one is the role of Nimasa and my role as chief executive of the maritime administration of the country. And, a, and, a, and, and a my role of course, as a statesman in rivers. Yes. That's two different things. One, as Nimasa, our function is regulatory. Regulate shipping and maritime activities. That we know. There's an agency to regulate the environment. In any case, the issue of the environment is the concurrent list. It's under the purview of the state as much as under the purview of the center, the federal government. So primarily, it is not my responsibility as chief executive or the agency, the respons nor is it the responsibility, primary responsibility of the agency. The responsibility of the agency is to the extent that it, it mitigates pollution arising from shipping activities. That we understand. But you are a statesman. You are and, a party And I'd like man. to talk about being a key stakeholder in River State. Yes. Now, I'd I like to draw your attention to the fact that I made a open, series of open letters to the governor of River State, to the Federal Minister of Environment, drawing the attention to the dangers of the continuous, um, the, 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 the fact of having suits in River State. Danger to the health of the people. Danger to the means of livelihood. 
And of course, data, I have sufficient data to show that it's done enormous damage to the health of the people. And what response did you get? Now, I got some communications from the Federal Ministry of Environment at various times that, oh, at some point they raised the issue that they were not getting enough cooperation from River State government. At other times, they said, listen, we're dealing with it. Um, I'm, I'm curious to understand what cooperation the, the real estate government was supposed to give. I remember in the year 2017, if I'm not mistaken, a committee was put together by the state government to look into the suit. I remember a, a lemon petrochemical, some of those people. Were um, part of the committee. Exactly. I'm very much aware. But when you say that there was no cooperation from the real estate government, how do you mean? I'm telling you the communication I got from Federal Minister of Environment. But you lived in River State. You came to River State. You breathe that air. Mm. If somebody gives you information, do you not take further steps to understand what and that I communication did. meant and, I and how you could further push for a, a move from the federal government? Apparently. Now, what happened is that the two levels of government were acting in opposite direction. The federal government or the Federal Ministry of Environment had her own ideas of how to solve the suit problem. And he now, hasn't they solved. attributed it to illegal refining of petroleum products. That was, for them, that was the primary cause of the suit in River State. What in local parlance is called oil fire. Now, one of the things they did, and of course, I will not always agree with that approach, was to put the Navy on the alert and ensure that you stop illegal refining of petroleum products. But that does not clean the environment. Now, they've also initiated what they call the high prep program. The high prep program was originally focused on the Ogoni areas. But in course of this, they've further expanded their mandate to other areas of River State. But like every other thing, it requires a process. And I know that they've done a number of remedial measures. I am not satisfied with what they've done. I have seen pictures, I have seen videos recently, I'm talking about 2021, and the suit is still in the air. Oh, and yes, so These definitely. remedial efforts seem to be of no avail. Again, I ask, what pressure have you put in 2021 on the government, the federal government? Because again, um, the federal government has the power to security agencies. They're the, the power is at the to center. To stop to the deal illegal with the refining yes. of petroleum products. Which you have pointed yes. uh, that the federal, the, the federal Ministry of Environment has said is the major cause for... From their studies, yes. Exactly. So what is holding the federal government from cleaning it out entirely? Because we have the reins now. No, but what, what, I, I, can what, say, what I can say to you, that I can, I can turn out the statistics, that reasonably, the level of suit has dropped. Has it? Yes, it has. I can tell you that. Now, the number of um, illegal um, refining of crude has also dropped because of the intervention of the Navy. Now, the, what remains to be done is the fact that the Federal Ministry of Environment should work collaboratively with the University Ministry of Environment and begin to clean impacted sites and impacted environment. That's the next logical step I expect them to take. Hmm. Interesting. Let's move away from that so that it's, it doesn't become the biggest part of our conversation. But let's go back to the PIB. Uh, another controversial part of that bill is the Frontier Basin Exploration Fund, which, oh my God, people are crazy about it. The fact that the executive has proposed 10% uh, not, not 10%. Well, according to reports, 10% rent for the fund which is yes. meant to explore Cumulative 30% of all. Yes, yes. However, um, in the passing of the bill, the lawmakers resolved that there will be 30%. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, especially for, proposed for the NMPC um, all profits from the exploration. A lot of people have asked why we have to allocate that much to explore land in the Chad Basin and all of those areas when we already haven't been able to deal with the problems of exploration in the Niger Delta. Now, um, it's not about exploration in the Niger Delta. It's about the fact that oil exploration, whether in the frontier basin, in the deep sea, onshore, should be a private sector activity. It shouldn't be the primary concern of government. Now, it is a profit-oriented venture. And the, the, it, the best government should do ought to be to provide some basket of incentive. Listen, if you do exploration and you find oil, we're going to give you the following concession. 
in other clients. That's what's done. Not for government itself to fund exploration. But even that model of government funding exploration, why do we need to put cumulatively 30% of our earnings on frontier exploration? Question so I what ask. it means is that if we put that fund, and at the end of the day, now what happens is that government bureaucracy will continue to feast on the fund and they will find no oil. Every year you give them 30%, 10% from the profit of MPC and 20% from all the other um, collective that you put together in a basket. Every year they will go out for exploration and they will never find oil. The reason is simple. They are comfortable having 30% of that fund. But if you make it a commercial venture, a private sector uh, venture, it is in their interest to find oil as soon as possible because that's the only period they will begin to make their money. Interestingly, governors of... And so this will be penny-wise and pound okay. foolish. Which, which you seem to be in agreement with the people who are criticizing this. The governors of the southern states have also kicked against It's not about governors of southern states. I'm being very realistic. I'm yeah, I know, I know. I, but I want to... I'm going somewhere. We have experienced militancy in the Niger Delta over the years, which stemmed from the fact that Oil was being taken from the Niger Delta, but they were not seeing the dividends of that oil exploration in terms of um, health care facilities, education, no schools. I mean, you would see buildings that were commissioned, but they are all just lying fallow. How do we prevent this from happening again? Because it might raise its ugly head with this agitation against the 30% for all frontiers exploration. How do we stop this from happening? Because you're sitting here to say, we should have privatized it. We should not, it should not be government's business. But, well, here we are. This is what the bill says. How do we deal with that? Plus, coupled with the fact that the government has its plate full with the pockets of violence, ethnic agitations, and insecurity that's going across the country. Now, um, I'd like to make this clear. It's still a bill. It's not an act yet. Well, What it means is that if we identify deficiencies or loopholes in the bill, it can still be addressed. It can be addressed in two ways. One, at the conference committee of both chambers of the National Assembly or by the presidency just before ascent. You can send it back. We're not doing the country any good by putting 30% of our funds for oil exploration and like any, every other thing, typically government. What it means is that you put bureaucracy in place every day, every year, every, every, every um, budget circle. You give them 30%, they keep, and they'll break down. And say, oh, I'm chief executive now of some frontier exploration agency or some frontier department in the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment or frontier this in, in some government department. And, of course, they will feast on it. I made that, I've made that point very, very clear. But that if you say the private sector, the incentive will give you is that if you go do your seismic work and find oil in, in commercial quantity, then we're going to... And that was actually the model that enabled Shell and early early firms that did exploration in, in the Niger Delta region find oil. Oh, you're going to have exclusive exploration rights for so-so number of years. We're going to give you this acreage and all of that. So, if we go with this model, the same challenges we face currently in the Niger Delta will be replicated in other regions of the country. And it will be an endless cycle. I don't think that's what we want for, for ourselves as a country. Or as a people. Hmm. And when people begin to... It, it will let in a day when we begin to find out that that model is not working. But, you know, at this age and time, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should look at models that worked in other areas. How did they do it? Study it, adapt it to our environment, and, and apply it. It, it beats me, and I'm, I'm not sure if you want to answer this question, but because you've been a member of the National Assembly, you travel, you go on programs across the you know the globe you see these models that you're making reference to and you see how it's working but then when you come home it seems like we do not want local to... politics what well who's this local politics benefiting because your job is to serve us and do make decisions or pass bills that would help us to get better as a country instead of taking us back to the dark ages i know that you're not a member of the house of assembly but you were so a uh, national assembly what, why, why does it's this It's unfortunate happening? that um, very many of us do not look at things from a pan-Nigerian perspective and a long-term perspective. You know, what happens is that we come very often with ethnic or regional 
um, agenda. And when you say we, I was not looking at the par Nigerian agenda. Well, I was in the National Assembly, and I know that a few of us uh, looked at things from the prism of a national agenda, not from the prism of a regional agenda. But what I know clearly is that majority, yes, it's a pan Nigerian institution, majority looks at issues from a regional agenda, regional perspective. But that's been short sighted, you know. On the long run, you need to look at things from the bigger picture. It's a challenge, you know. Patriotism is a challenge in this country. Let's talk about the politics of Nigeria since we're already there. Um, the issue of the electronic transmission of results, uh, that's also been an issue uh, that's uh, been on the news. Um, now, people who have been advocating for this electronic transmission of results by INEC um, seem to have been very disappointed by uh, the recent outcome where it's been removed totally from the Electoral Act bill, which is going to be extended to soon. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because uh, why, what do you presume the Senate's, why, what, what was happening in the minds of the Senate's members to actually take this out? Even though, um, I mean, I've understood American politics and there are certain states who still do manual voting and there are states who still do e-voting. But we're in the 21st century where we do electronic transfers of monies and other things. Why should this be taken out in 2021? if we have been advocating for it for several years? I, I like to put it in perspective. Um, what has happened is that the Senate committee inserted a clause, clause 50 sub 2, saying that that clause outlaws electronic transmission of results, not electronic voting. And I'll come and I'll try to distinguish what's going on. And my initial take is that it's like putting the electoral system of the country on reverse gear. Instead of moving forward, we want to retrogress, we want to move backward, and that's absolutely unfair. It simply will destroy everything we have achieved thus far in the electoral evolution process. Uh, everything wrong with our system has to do with the electoral system. You know, when we have bad leaders, it leads to the fact that education suffers, healthcare suffers, infrastructure suffers, the economy suffers, and it's all a product of the electoral system. In the past few years, we thought we've made a lot of gain. Um, in as recent as the do elections, the INEC tried using electronic transmission of results, and it, indeed it was wonderful. That's why you had an opposition candidate, Governor Basiki, who got returned, who got elected um, for the second time as governor of a do state. Now, what that committee, I'm not saying Senate, I didn't say the Senate. I said what that committee is suggesting is that we should go back to manual collation of results, then hand carry the results from the various units to the ward, from the ward to the local government for coalition, from local government to state, from state to federal. It's absolutely unfair. It's uncharitable. Um, it's unpatriotic. It's everything evil. It represents evil. It represents um, typical retrogression. Now, if you look at every other place, initially, the thoughts is that we will progress from electronic transmission of results to electronic voting. We are not at electronic voting right now. No. What we've done as a country is that currently uh, we do electronic registration of voters, even when it is partial, and electronic accreditation. It was first tried in 2015 when I happened, I was privileged to be a candidate in 2015. Um, and now we think that we, our thoughts is that the National Assembly will codify, put in proper legal framework, the issue of accreditation and progress, of course, to the electronic transmission of results, and in the near future, we'll go into electronic uh, voting. But we're not seeing that. We're rather seeing that instead of moving forward, we are on a reverse gear. That's, that's totally not acceptable. So now, with manual, uh, manual transmission of results, when you carry from unit, before, from the unit to the world, there will be disputes. There will be contest about which result is original. Because, of course, another result will surface. Mm -hmm. And when it moves from there, between the world and the LGA, of course, there will be a lot of contest. And that's why very often, almost all elections end up in court. And so instead of the people's choice prevailing, it is about the decision of the various courts. But and that denies the people the right of free choice of electing their leaders. And when they are not, when they are denied the right of electing the, the leaders, the leaders are no longer accountable to the people. They know that it is not the people that put them there. They may be maneuvered their way through the court process, 
but, but, but yeah, just to tie to what you're saying, so these leaders are also found in the National Assembly and they could be in that committee. Oh, could yes, it, my, could my it be, take. Could my it take. be I that tell you this. this is the reason why they continuously are dilly darling around this situation because uh, obviously it's in the benefit or in the best interest it, of the average politician? And, and you know, what happens is that the Electoral Act provides the governance framework for elections in the country. And so if somebody has intent to cheat in the near future, it begins with the Electoral Act. And so there must be. But I know that the Senate will rise to the occasion and correct this defect for which Nigerians have risen up in one voice to speak against manual transmission of, of uh, elect, elect, election results. Now, mind you, there's also the House. The House provides another window of opportunity for Nigerians to correct that. The House is... Uh, it's, a, it's a bigger platform representing more Nigerians than the Senate. Well, they represent a equal number of Nigerians. Of course, you know, the Senate, you have three per state. The House, you have more persons in the House, younger people, younger elements, more vibrant elements in the House. And I believe that they will correct this. Hmm. Like, uh, the, His Excellency, the right, the Honorable Speaker, Femi Bajabi Miller, had said, oh, please, why Nigerians? Uh, please, why not wait for the House version? Ultimately, when the House deals with her own version of the, of the Electoral Act, then they move to uh, a conference committee and harmonize positions. I'm very optimistic that at the end of the day, they will be able to fix this. Because for us, as a people, um, for now, I, I don't know of an alternative to electronic transmission of uh, uh, results. In any case, the machines are designed in such a way that if you vote... The machines will transmit the results. So I don't know that the met machines that will be, oh, you vote using some electronic means to vote. Then when it comes to transmission, that means they're going to manufacture special machines for Nigeria. Well, that, that, that's an issue that we our will own, continue our to Our passion is to strengthen the electoral process so that strengthen it, that it guarantees credibility and integrity. The whole essence of democracy is that periodic elections should, should, have the, should enjoy the confidence of Nigerians, should be credible, so Nigerians will continue to have faith in democracy. Well, that can't happen until that, until the, the, the bill, that section of the bill is changed. Oh, so well, I've heard Nigerians come out speak forcefully, saying, oh, um, well, what the Senate what, what, committee did represents the position of Nigerians. That's not our position. That's not our aspiration. Exactly. So, well, well people have been, um, you know, campaigning that, all Nigerians call the the members of the uh, the their, their representatives. Their, their representatives. Yes, of course, and Both in Senate impress and the upon House. them to you know uh, make make the right moves. But let's let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're still talking with uh, Dakuku Ador Peterside. He is the former Director General of NIMASA. And when we come back, we'll be talking about insecurity and the state of the nation. Stay with us. <laughs> 